Good afternoon and welcome to week one, Homeland Security. Dr. Scott here. I hope you guys are doing pretty good. I'm talking to you guys during my lunch hour. I wanted to go over chapters one, two, and three for you guys and get you guys uh, on board and ready to roll for the next five weeks. So chapter one opens up with Homeland Security entitled The Concept and the Organization. The Department of Homeland Security, as we know it today, is the result of actions taken in the immediate and ongoing aftermath of the events of September 11, 2001. In fact, just nine days after the attack, the President announced by executive order that the Office of Homeland Security would be established within the White House and that the Homeland Security Council uh, would uh, be established to develop and coordinate the implementation of a comprehensive national strategy uh, to secure the United States from terrorist threats and attacks. Now, despite the obvious connection between the events, excuse me, sorry, I'm catching my breath here. Now, despite the obvious connection uh, between the events in the department, the movement to establish such broad sweeping measures was initiated long before the attacks took place. Domestic and international terrorists have been striking Americans, American facilities, and American interests both within the United States and outside on our na nation's borders for decades. Though, only fleeting interest uh, has, was garnered in the aftermath of these events. Now, out of the tragic events of September 11th, an enormous opportunity for improving the social and economic sustainability of our communities from all threats, but primarily terrorism, uh, was envisioned identified as Homeland Security. Public safety officials and emergency managers championed the concept of an all-hazards approach, and despite some unique characteristics, they felt terrorism could be incorporated into that approach as well. However, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, a single issue of preventing a future terrorist attack was foremost in the minds of federal officials and legislatures, as well as citizens. Much has changed with regards to national security since September 11th attacks. One of the most tangible examples came on September 24th, 2001, when President Bush announced that he would be seeking a passage of an act entitled Uniting and Strengthening America by Providing Appropriate Tools Required to Intercept and Obstruct Terrorism, which later became known as the U.S. Patriot Act of 2001. This act was introduced uh, a large number of controversial legislative changes in order to significantly increase the surveillance and investigative powers of law enforcement agencies in the United States, as it states, to deter and punish terrorist acts in the United States and around the world. This was signed into law by the President on October 26, with very little deliberation in Congress. Now, the nature of Homeland Security, as it is now becoming more commonly known, quickly developed through the issuance of numerous Homeland Security presidential directives, or what we call HSPDs, which were specifically designed to record and communicate presidential decisions about the Homeland Security policies in the United States, which was HSPD-1 in 2001. The most significant of these included several topics, organization and operation of the Homeland Security Council, we had to form a council, combating terrorism through immigration policies, Homeland Security Advisory System. Uh, another one was the national strategy to, com to combat weapons of mass destruction, management in to domestic incidents, integration and use of screening information, critical infrastructures identification, prioritization and protection, we had the defense in, of the United States of agricultural and food, biodefense for the 21st century, the comprehensive terrorist-related screening procedures, and then there were several on, uh, including national cyber uh, security initiatives, public health and medical preparedness, uh, Arctic region policy, and biometrics for identification and screening to enhance national security, which effectively formed into the TSA and NSA and all those other three-letter uh, agencies we love, uh, love to get to know better. So with that, the creation of the Department of Homeland Security affected many government functions, including that of emergency management given to uh, incorporation of FEMA in, into the new department. After DHS was established in 2002, the Department of Homeland Security, most of the FEMA grant programs and non-disaster funding focused on terrorism programs were devo diverted and reduced to support counterterrorism efforts. Because of this, many state and local governments who were more concerned about natural disasters had no choice but to focus on terrorism. Similar decisions in the 1980s over nuclear attack, attack planning uh, have been blamed on the botched response to Hurricane Andrew, and it could be said that the, that the same explain, explanations uh, or failures occurred with uh, Hurricane Katrina as well. Now, following the Katrina debacle, the focus of Homeland Security shifted back in the direction of all hazards, preparedness, mitigation, response, and recovery, and the post-Katrina Emergency Management Reform Act helped to reestablish many of uh, the since-moved or dissolved uh, former offices and functions of FEMA.
The Obama administration continues to build on the efforts of the Bush administration to understand and implement a more balanced universal approach to homeland security, as reflected in the first um, ever let me fix this, quadrennial homeland security uh, review. Now, the nature of terrorism itself is quickly changing. However, homeland security uh, must follow suit, reflecting that increasing complex issues surrounding homeland security the recent completed QHSR, which is the, uh, uh, the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review, uh, was revised the definition of homeland security to incorporate more global and comprehensive approach, not just focusing on the United States. They now identify that the homeland security enterprise, described as the federal, state, local, tribal, territorial, non-governmental, and private sector entities, entities, as well as individual families and communities who share common national interests in the safety and security of America and the American population. DHS is one of many components of the national enterprise which in addition in addition to countering terrorists also work to secure the borders and manage immigration, protect the infrastructure and manage the relationships uh, between the United States and other nations among other important tasks. The QHSR elaborates on the definition of homeland security as the intersection of evolving threats and hazards within traditional government and civic responsibilities by civil defense, emergency response, law enforcement, customs border control, and immigration. Now, by creating this broader definition of homeland security, DHS is stressing the diversity of organizations and individuals who have responsibility for and interest in the safety and security of the United States. That also includes local law enforcement, sheriff's departments, uh, state troopers here in Texas. DHS has defined the following concepts. Uh, the following three concepts as a foundation for a comprehensive approach to homeland security. Number one is security. Protect the United States and its people, vital interests in the way of life. Resilience. Foster individual community and system robustness, adaptability, and the capacity for rapid recovery. And then third and most important, customs and exchange, the expedient and enforced lawful trade, travel, and immigration. So that kind of sums up chapter one. All right, this kind of in broad terms, tell you how DHS came into uh, fruition before and right after the September 11 attacks, as well as the mandates. Now, in Chapter 2, we take a brief look at the historic overview of the terroristic threat. The actions of the U.S. government uh, in the wake of 9-11 to recognize emergency management, public safety, and security may have seemed unprecedented, but not this is not the case. All right? The reality is that similar actions in terms of both type and scope have happened in the past, and these historical experiences can provide insight into the prospect of the ultimate success or failure of the actions that have taken uh, place since September 11th. Previous re reorganizations and historical emergency management experience offers insight into Homeland Security's future. So if you go back to the early history from the 1800s to the creation of FEMA, all right, the first federal involvement, uh, involvement in disaster management began in 1803, the Congressional, uh, Congressional Act to provide financial assistance to, the New to a New Hampshire town. During the 1930s, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and the Bureau of Public Roads made disaster loans available for public facilities and the Tennessee Valley Authority was created to reduce flooding in addition to generating electricity. In 1934, we had the Flood Control Act and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers authority to design and build flood control projects. The federal support of these activities was vested in the Federal Civil Defense Administration, or what we call FCDA, an organization with few staff and limited financial resources whose main role was to provide technical assistance. A companion office to the FCDA was the Office of Defense Mobilization was established in the Department of Defense, or DOD. The primary function of this office were to allow for the quick mobilization of materials and the production of stockpiling of critical materials in the event of war. By 1958, these two offices were merged into the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization. Now, moving into the 1960s, they were marked by a number of major disasters. One of those was the Hebgen Lake earthquake, which raised attention to the fact that earthquake risks extended far beyond California's borders. Following Hurricanes Donna and Carla, the incoming Kennedy administration decided to change the federal approach to disasters uh, and created the Office of Emergency Preparedness inside the White House. Distinguishing these activities from the civil defense responsibilities, the remainder of the 1960s continued to see devastating natural disasters, the most damaging of which was the 1964 Prince William Sound earthquake and Hurricane Betsy and Hurricane Camille. 
The government responded with the passage of an ad hoc legislation for funds. However, the financial losses resulting from Hurricane Betsy brought about the passage of the National Flood Insurance Act of 1968, which in turn created the National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP, which all of us right now are pretty much wondering, should we have flood insurance in Texas with all the rain we've had in the last several weeks? The Disaster Relief Fund of 1974 gave the uh, HUD the greatest EM emergency management authority. Though EM, EM functions existed concurrently in several other federal agencies, under President Carter, with a strong state support, and following the accidental of the, th the accident at Three Mile Island, which most of you guys remember, the, emer the Federal Emergency Management Agency was created in 1978. This is FEMA. Now, under FEMA, the majority of federal emergency management tasks were consolidated. Uh, however, FEMA's first years were marked by the resistance of such integration. During the 1980s, FEMA's top priority was nuclear attack preparedness. Statutory authority steadily moved from the state to the federal level, and the funding for state and local programs decreased. When Hurricane Andrew struck in 1992, a across, uh, response across the entire federal government was so poor that FEMA's very existence was questioned. Incoming President Clinton recognized the existence of an opportunity to fully reform the federal emergency management function and appoint the season's James Lee Witt as director of the reinvigorated re uh, agency, or FEMA. Now, the threat of a major natural disaster, even multiple disasters, was the government's primary concern at the time. With other man-made and intentional risks considered remote, knowledge of terrorist risks existed by the assumption as that it would occur overseas and not inside the borders. This changed in 1993 with the World Trade Center bombing, the first one. Now, the bombing of the World Trade Center presented new threats on a large scale of uh, terrorism. Prior to this event, bombings typically targeted local government offices, such as post offices and medical facilities. Also, these events were considered criminal acts by individuals rather than concert, constant, uh, concentrated or concerted international effort. This bombing changed that and changed that and it resulted in increased counterterrorism uh, efforts including the Violent Crime Control Act and the Law Enforcement Act of 1994. Among the provisions of this act, <clears throat> which was the most comprehensive crime legislation in the United States history, were an expanded application to the death penalty, which we never saw before. They basically read that acts of terrorism or use of weapons of mass destruction and significant increases in funding in the Immigration and Naturalization INS Border Patrol and Bureau uh, FBI. Now, the Murrah Building, uh, Federal Building bombing, the bombing of the Murrah uh, Federal Building in, um, let me see, that was the, making sure I get this right, I'm trying to give you guys my notes here. Uh, the bombing of the Murrah Federal Building represented the next major domestic terrorism incident. All right, this resulting rescue and the recovery effort lasted 16 days and involved, um, among others, 11 FEMA urban search and rescue teams. This event boosted uh, efforts to establish the, non, the Nun Luger Dominici legislation that was aimed at better preparing the nation for terrorist attack and to provide the primary authority and focus for domestic federal terrorism preparedness activities. The legislation in the Defense Against Weapons of Mass Destruction Act of 1996 did not, however, address who would lead the agency in terrorism. At this time, uh, many faulted FEMA leadership for not quickly claiming that role, and many state emergency directors, emergency management directors, had looked uh, to the agency to do so. Unfortunately, leadership uh, vacillated, uh, vacillated on the issue. And while terrorism was part of the all-hazards approach, the resources and technology needed to address specific issues remained beyond the reach of the disaster structure at the time. So fast forwarding to June 25th, 1996, the Kobar Towers uh, bombing in Saudi Arabia. In, uh, in, at this date, a truck bomb was detonated out at the U.S. Forces Command in Kobar Towers uh, building in Raida. Now, the quick actions of the Air Force Sentry uh, minimized the deaths and injuries, and anonymous communications prior to the attack gave indication that something might be imminent. In the aftermath of the attack, the U.S. military and different members of the intelligence community gathered and were criticized for lack of preparation for such an event, and most felt that this was the result of an intelligence failure. So afterwards, we had three commissions that were kind of met, forged together to look at this. Uh, and this was after the Kobar Towers. The United States Commission on the National Security 21st Century, uh, this commission was created to make strategic recommendations on how the U.S. government uh, should ensure the nation's security in the coming years. This commission recommended the creation of National Homeland Security Agency, NHSA, mm -hmm. with the responsibility for planning, coordinating, and integrating U various U.S. government activities involved in Homeland Security. 
Many of these commission's findings were later integrated into the justification legislation behind the Department of Homeland Security. We also had the Gilmore Commission, uh, which basically looked at the, uh, it was an advisory panel to assess domestic response capabilities for terrorism involving weapons of mass destruction and the Bremer, Bremer, B-R-E-M-E-R, commission, known as the National Commission on Terrorism. So during these commissions, we had a couple of things come out of them. Uh, the presidential decision, which was known as Directive 62 and 63, addressed combating terrorism and protecting America's critical infrastructure. The Attorney General's five-year interagency counterterrorism and technology crime plan was formed in December 1998 as mandated by Congress, the Department of Justice, or DOJ, through the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They began a coordinated project with other agencies to develop the Attorney General's five-year interagency counterterrorism and technology crime plan. The FBI emerged as the federal government's principal agency for responding to and investigating terrorism, but the plan did not facilitate interagency sharing of information. Basically said that everything goes into the FBI and they don't have to share back, and that's always been a source of contention among other agencies. Uh, going forward again, on October 12, 2000, we had the U.S. coal bombing in Yemen. While refueling in the port of Aden in Yemen, the U.S. Navy destroyer, the USS Cole, sustained a suicide bomb attack. Differences existed about whether this was an act of terrorism or war. Both the Clinton and Bush administration have been criticized for not responding with military force on this attack before the September 11th attack. The Navy responded by creating an anti-terrorism and prevention warfare center and aggressively implemented a stronger random anti-terrorism measure, which is RAM, to, secure, to their security posture. Fast forwarding a year later, just about, we had the September 11, 2001 terror attacks, which involved the hijacking and intentional crashing of four commercial airplanes hijacked and used as weapons, were together a watershed event in the creation of the Homeland Security Department. This event resulted in the collapse of several buildings in downtown New York City, including both World Trade Center towers. The collapse of this section of the Pentagon and the crash in a field in Pennsylvania. There was the, the loss of 2,974 lives and uh, which 343 were firefighters and 75 were police officers shocked both the public and the government and immediately changed the way for life in America. Therefore, right after that, just nine days after the 9-11 attacks, George, President George W. Bush uh, announced by Executive Order 13228 or 13228 that an Office of Homeland Security would be established within the White House directed by PA Governor Tom Ridge. This order also created the Homeland Security Council to develop and coordinate the implementation of a comprehensive national strategy to secure the United States from terrorist attacks. Four days later, President Bush announced that he would be seeking passage of the known Patriot Act of 2001, which was created considerable controversy, like we said. If you all have been paying attention to the news, we just had to uh, vote on it again. It was uh, basically set uh, as, as, uh, uh, for review in the legislature and the Senate. Missed it, and they went back, had an emergency session, and voted on uh, remaining key, having key parts stay in the law right now. So not a whole lot's changed with the Patriot Act. On uh, October 29, 2001, President Bush issued that many of the uh, first of the many Homeland Security Presidential Directives, HSPDs, which I talked about earlier in Chapter 1. On March uh, 21, uh, 2002, President Bush signed Executive Order 13260, establishing the President's Homeland Security Advisory Council and Senior Advisory Committees for Homeland Security. Also in March of 2002, the President issued uh, what we call HSPD-3, which created the color-coded Homeland Security Advisory Team. Out of this, we have the result of the 9-11 Commission. And President Bush uh, established that the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks in the United States, informally known as the 9-11 Commission, the Commission was charged with looking into the events leading up to September 1st, or September 11th, excuse me, uh, and the attacks and the actions that were taken immediately following the attack and making recommendations to the President and Congress. The major findings of the Commission report issued on July 22, 2004, which is almost three years later, uh, were that, that uh, there were government failures in policy, capabilities, and management. Of the criticisms vaulted at DHS, one of the most significant was that the emergency management focus at all government levels had shifted from all hazards philosophy towards the linear focus on terrorism. A failed response to Hurricane Katrina exposed the cracks in the nation's emergency management system, judged by both government and independent after-action uh, after reports. Many of the people uh, problems, excuse me, many of the problems uh, were found to be the result of priority focus on terrorism. While well, elected officials in response 
agency stumbled. The NGO stepped up and to provide extraordinary uh, services to storm victims. Congress drew up a legislation, the Post-Katrina Emergency Management Reform Act, to patch many of the holes that had been exposed and develop new systems to reduce future failure. From the moment at least it seemed that the nation's emergency management focus will, uh, be, will re, was willing to regain its all-hazards approach. So moving forward to the Obama administration, <clears throat> we've gotten through Katrina, we've gotten through uh, the uh, creation of FEMA. Many expected dramatic uh, change relative to Homeland Security when President Obama uh, was elected. Some even expected the new administration would remove FEMA from DHS. However, this didn't happen. Recognizing the importance of border issues, President Obama nominated Janet Napoliano to the DH secret to, to be DHS secretary. Excuse me. And she uh, was and remains committed to addressing issues facing the department as well as aggressively tackling the emergency threats to, as cyber, such as cybersecurity. Despite this, on Christmas Day 2009, a Na Nigerian national attempted unsuccessfully to detonate explosives hidden in his underwear, prompting Napoliano to admit that the system had failed after initially touting success. On the uh, contrary, a high point in the administration's efforts came when bin Laden was located and killed on May 2nd, 2011. In May 2011, the Obama administration proposed a comprehensive cybersecurity legislation. Among the highlight in this legislation, including consolidating the 47 different state laws that require businesses to report breaches of their cybersecurity system to customers, DHS will now or will then will, will look, work with industry to prioritize the most important cyber threats and vulnerabilities, provide clear authority to how the federal government to provide the assistance to state and local governments when there has been a cyber breach, uh, which will also provide immunity to the industry, states, local government when sharing cybersecurity information with DHS. And this will also provide a new framework to protect individuals' privacy and civil liberties. Now, moving on to this chapter three for this week, we're going to discuss hazards. All right, we've covered uh, kind of how things kind of came into play. I'm giving you guys a broad overview, but the hazards of what we're dealing with now, uh, and I spent a little bit of time talking about this uh, simply because it's real. It's still here in 2015, but the Department of Homeland Security is responsible. Uh, basically for preparing for the prevention of and the mitigation of the response to a wide portfolio of hazards uh, that includes much more than terrorism. Any destabilizing incident or factor is a threat to national security and more deaths, injuries and dollars and property damage have been caused by natural disasters than any other hazard type. So we've shifted from focusing on terrorism to going back to natural disasters. All right, we've had, if you guys look recently, we've had, uh, you know, today, you know, hurricane bills making its way through Texas. We've had massive amounts of rainfalls. We've had earthquakes uh, from California. We've had several in Oklahoma recently. We had unprecedented snowdrops or snowfalls uh, up in the Northeast. Uh, we've got droughts already occurring in parts of California. So really, we're going back to looking at national, natural disasters. Now, the nation's national hazard profile remained relatively unchanged for decades with regards to its makeup. However, hazard risk has uh, changed as a result of migration, climate change, and other factors. Uh, disasters are now more frequent and causing more damage. With the rise in terrorism risk, the nature and hazard set as expanded within, for many jurisdictions. Uh, the four categories of terrorist hazards of greatest concern were referred to those as the CBRNE, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear, and explosive weapons. Much less is known about the CBRNE hazards than natural hazards, including their properties and destructive capabilities, and there was much less experience uh, with them at the local level. Now, it will likely take considerable time before we have reached an adequate level of comfort with regard to our knowledge of new hazards. Terrorism hazards also differ from natural and even technological hazards in the manner in which uh, we encounter each. Terrorism hazards are intentional and seek to target civilian populations and cause as much damage as possible. A hazard uh, is a source of danger and is named for the emergency disaster that could occur. Hazards carry risk, represented by the likelihood and consequence. The product of realized hazard risk is an emergency event. When response to an emergency exceeds capabilities, the event is a disaster. That's real simple. Let me re repeat that. When response to an emergency exceeds the capabilities, the event is known as a disaster. Each hazard is distinct with regards to its characteristics, but there are three, there are three umbrella groupings into which all hazards may be sorted out, uh, or which include natural hazards, technological hazards, and terrorist hazards. So those three, and I'm probably going to say it again on the quiz, 
is there's natural hazards, technological hazards, and terrorist hazards, or if you just remember NTT. Now, natural hazards uh, include floods, earthquakes, hurricanes, storm surges, tornadoes, wildfires, mass movements, tsunamis, everything you see on the news that's weather related. Technological hazards could be structure fires, transportation accidents, infrastructure failures, dam failures, uh, hazardous material in incidents or nuclear accidents, uh, not terrorism or a bomb, but like a nuclear leak or a nuclear, like a, a power core melting in a nuclear plant. Terrorism hazards, we're focusing on that CBRNE, the chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive types of weapons that are intentionally designed to basically increase mass destruction and civilian casualties. Other armed attacks using firearms or other tactics we look at, we look at shootings, mass shootings, kidnapping assaults, hostages, uh, stuff like that. So when you guys get a chance to review these three chapters, like I said, I've given you guys kind of a broad overview of what we're going to be talking about uh, this, this week. I know we move a lot and we got a lot going on. But take time, read the chapter, outline the chapter, get to know those key terms, then attempt to take your quiz. Okay, I don't care if you take it late Sunday night as long as it's before midnight. I want to see all y'all succeed in this class. Also, don't forget about the discussion board, your devotionals, and answering the review questions. As always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call me or send me an email or get in touch with me any way you need to. Look forward to hearing you guys on the discussion board. You'll have a great week. See you soon. Bye.